see here. Looks like we got audio. I'm going to have you guys give me a mic check real quick on uh, on this new microphone setup that we have and uh, just let me know if you can hear me clearly. All right, getting things set up. So yeah, just give me a mic check. Um, let me know if you can hear me clearly. Is the sound weird? Uh, am I too loud? Uh, that kind of stuff. We're just trying to dial everything in. We did some tests earlier this week and everything seemed to be working fine. I uh, just want to make sure that it still is. Okay, sounds low. Well, let's see. We're going to turn it up full gorilla here and see how the sound is now. Uh, <clears throat> You guys can also adjust the volume on your speakers so it doesn't get too loud. should not change too much during the show. Um, just let me know if that adjustment helped out with everything set up here. I'm going to try to bring the microphone a little bit closer to me so you can hear me clearly um, as we start the broadcast tonight. adjustments here making sure that everything is clear you can hear me now better but still a little low voice is clear okay well we'll have to work with what we got here because I got this thing turned up all the way and <laughs> I'm hoping that's gonna be loud enough for you uh, you guys can hear us clearly if not again a little better everything crank voice is clear okay it's better everything sounding better good um, that should be good enough to at least get rolling here, be able to listen back to this. I did some tests earlier this week. Um, everything sounds good. Okay, good. All right, good. A little, little hesitation there at the beginning, but we'll get rolling here real quick. Tonight's episode, we're going to uh, really dedicate to talking about oil filter housings, what your options are throughout the generations of the Coyotes, even the Voodoo and the Boss. Um what you need to keep, what you don't need to keep, and what's available out there to uh, <laughs> what's available out there for you to be able to uh, adapt it to aftermarket oil coolers, remote oil filters, that kind of suck, uh, stuff. So we'll get started on that here in a second. Uh, we'll do some you know regular uh, house cleaning work here. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Frank Perdomo with Power by the Hour Performance. If you've never been on our live stream before or know of our company, what we are dedicated to is um, Coyote Swap Solutions, Coyote Engine Swap Solutions, covering all three generations, Coyote, Boss 302, F-150, Mustang, and the Voodoo engines as well. We have a whole lineup of components to help you swap those engines, not only into Mustangs, but older Fords, anything. I mean, we've had them just about every vehicle that people drive <laughs> um, people drive or maneuver in so uh, we can definitely help you out in getting those coyote engines into just about anything as far as the powertrain outside of that we also offer a lot of different components to help manage the engine uh, get power steering on them that kind of stuff um, Kimbo saying you can't hear me here <laughs> everybody else can hear me Kimbo I might have to turn up your volume man I'm not sure um, or refresh the, uh, the stream on your end, buddy. The Power by the Hour Performance, if you're looking at any of our products, we are pbhperformance.com. Um, you can find us if you hashtag or search our hashtag through any of the social media outlets. It's either hashtag PBH Equipped or Power by the Hour or even Coyote Swap. Um, now, once you find any of that stuff, you're going to see a bunch of our customer stuff uh, and so forth. But you can see a lot of the products that we offer in motion on project cars and people that are using it on a regular basis. Shops, individual builders, wherever you are. Uh, we work with just about everybody out there. Um, and as you can see, probably you're read here in the chat tonight, we have our regulars. We got a lot of guys that are working through their builds and we've helped a lot of folks uh, get from point A to, to finish, basically from job to job one, as Ford would call it, as finishing their first project or, or more. Uh, we are enthusiasts. We're based out of West Palm Beach, Florida. 
and uh, we've been doing this since the beginning of the Coyotes. Uh, we've been involved with Coyote engines right from their inception. Uh, so we've been in the in the middle of it all from Gen 1 to current production, and there's no stopping now. Uh, that's it's really our main focus as far as developing products and doing builds and research and development and so forth. And PBH Live is just an extension of that. We do a lot of email support and sales on the phones. You can call us at 561-737-2331. You can email us, info at pbhperformance.com. That comes directly to me. And if you need to reach out to us in any other route, basically we are available through Facebook, through Instagram, although calling and email here live on the chat, those are the best avenues for us to get you in a timely fashion. Uh, sometimes, unfortunately, the stuff on IG and on Facebook gets mixed into the fray and, and we can't get to that stuff as quick. So if you need an immediate answer uh, on here, info at pbhperformance.com or call us Monday through Friday, 8 to 5 Eastern. And you'll see, we'll be able to get Christian, Frank Pezzo, or me on the phone. Today is Christian Papa's birthday, so if you are friends with him on Facebook or Instagram, make sure you reach out to him and wish him a happy birthday. He's a good guy. All right, so let's talk about Coyote engines. And in particular, we're going to be talking about the oil filter housings, They're the adapters as they call it. Now, all the Coyote engines are going to have a little bit of a different oil filter adapter and position. Now, starting in Gen 1, what we had was a nice short oil filter adapter that just had an FL500 filter on it. Sometimes it had an oil cooler. That was mainly on the Boss 302s and stuff like that. Um, all the oil coolers were basically fluid to fluid, you know, water to oil. Uh, you'll see in a lot of the photos I'm about to show you, they're basically just a big water to oil cooler that's mounted sandwiched between the oil filter and the housing. And then your lower radiator hose is going to have connections coming off it to feed it water in and out. Um, typically, there's not enough room in the vehicles that everyone's swapping unless you have a lot of room between the radiator and your fender wells or your frame rails and so forth to use that kind of stuff. So generally what we end up getting a lot of questions on is how do I remove it? Which one will work? Can I use another OEM application? Did the one that came on my engine, uh, is that going to be an option to use? And can we adapt it and do a remote oil filter or can we do a remote oil cooler and so forth? So we're going to try to answer a lot of those questions for you tonight. And we're going to start off by showing you typically what you find on your Generation 1 uh, on like a Mustang and so forth right here. We're showing you Boss 302, excuse me, this is going to be our Gen 2 oil filter house. Um, our Boss 302 stuff, unfortunately I don't have it set up yet, but anyway. So right here what we're showing you is your Generation 2 Mustang oil filter housing. This is typically what you're seeing a lot of people asking us questions on and naturally when you're looking at it you're seeing that you have this big oil filter membrane or, or housing that's sandwiched between the filter and the oil filter housing. Above that you're gonna have your oil pressure sender. Now the oil pressure sender in a Gen 2, in a Gen 1 really isn't of any importance to how the engine runs they're more there for a warning lamp if it falls below a certain oil pressure. The oil cooler itself, naturally, because of the size and we're running different power steering pumps, different frame rails, different suspension, most likely it's going to be in the way. So if the oil filter in this orientation here, similar to what you would find on a Gen 1 car, um, would work, then all you would have to do is remove the um, the oil the oil filter remove the oil filter stud and then get the oil cooler off of there and replace it with this little guy now this stud is basically designed to go into the oil filter housing without the oil cooler in the way and allow you to attach the oil filter now what you're gonna see and the reason why we can do that is because the oil filter adapter and the oil cooler are basically designed to attach and seal to that oil filter housing the same way. Oh, excuse me, showing you this side here. So, that oil filter stud that passes through the cooler, this is the guy you're going to remove. And it's designed to basically go through the entire housing 
and then give you provisions to put your oil filter here on the other end. Once we remove this, this guy just falls right off. Um, they're not bad to use. There's definitely, if you can get it packaged into your project, it's not a bad idea to keep them. Um, but the, the packaging of it is a little bit of a problem. Now the oil filter adapter, there's really nothing wrong with these housings. I mean, you can use them um, if they do work for you. Um, and there are options to adapt these to go and do remote oil filters so you don't have to get a block mounted adapter if you don't want to. Uh, if you feel like the positioning of it is better for you, then you can use that. But typically, what you're going to find is on an F-150 engine, for example, that this thing's sticking way out there. It's, it's in the way of a lot of stuff. So the oil cooler is typically going to be something that comes off. Now, what you see here on the Gen 2 F-150 that I'm showing you here um, is very similar to what you're going to find on a Gen 3 because it does have the oil pressure solenoid or the control valve and it has an oil pressure sender. Now all the engines are going to have an oil pressure sender. The only time it comes into play or can interfere with how the engine runs is when you get into a generation 3 engine. If it doesn't see the oil pressure sender, it's going to it's basically going to limit your RPMs to about 4000. It's going to have like a soft limiter basically in place like a uh, something that would be along the lines of um, a fail-safe mode in a sense. Now that oil control solenoid in a Gen 2 and a Gen 3 we believe serves the same purpose. We believe what Ford's doing there is it's controlling the amount of oil pressure so it doesn't create too much of a load on the engine and it actually helps with fuel economy. Um, it, we haven't seen or read anywhere in the Ford manuscripts or the, the manuals that it does anything else other than that. So it can be deleted in Gen 2 and Gen 3, but you have to make sure in Gen 3 that they have the oil pressure sender still in play and plugged in. In Generation 2, you can get rid of it. You don't need it. Um, you, you can basically just tie up the wiring out of the way. It's used more for, um, for gauges and so forth. Um, and you don't really need to have it on the engine. Now, if you feel better, like on my Gen 1 engine, at the time we really didn't understand that stuff, so I just got an adapter and I have both my oil pressure sender for my aimed at acquisition in there, and then we have the factory one plugged in, and that way I can avoid having any loose connectors flying around, that kind of stuff. It does give me a potential of having another place where I can leak, but it's not that big of a deal. I mean, if you install it properly, you really don't have anything to worry about if you tie it up out of the way you don't have anything to worry about now if you remove your factory sender in generation one and generation two the thread pitch on that sensor is very close to what the aftermarket uses so you don't have to worry about getting any crazy adapters to do it you can just kind of put it in there in some cases you may have a bushing from the supplier or whoever you're using for your oil pressure uh, gauge but that's about it generation three that changed they did a different thread pitch and I believe, and we're looking into us, we're waiting for one to come in, and there's a gentleman by the name of Bobby Wartman um, that has done this. Um, he um, found that there is a piece, I believe from Vibrant, that has the right thread pitch. I think it's a 16 millimeter thread pitch, or a 16 millimeter thread that allows you then to, um, to put your factory sender in while still having ports that you can use for aftermarket senders, and it's used for turbo stuff, for feed and so forth out to the turbos. It's not specifically for a Coyote, so don't search for it as a Coyote. Just look at that product lineup. We may add it to our catalog. We may not. We're waiting on one to come in and take a look at it, make sure it's a quality piece. Uh, real quick, before we get too far into this, can everybody hear me okay in the chat? Can everybody communicate well in the chat? It, uh, last week, I actually lost the ability to read the live chat for some reason. Um, so just checking in, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully it's still working. Just give me a thumbs up or something. Um, so we can make sure that we're still connected and so forth and you can hear me. Um, yep. So continuing on, um, let's take a look at what a Gen 3 oil filter adapter and what that the wiring and what the positions of it are. If you look at this diagram that I have on the screen right now, this diagram is showing you the two connectors you're going to find on the oil pressure on the oil filter housing in a generation 3 F150. The lower one is the oil control solenoid. The upper one is your oil pressure sender. 
So what's important about that is that that lower one is the one that you can remove. The upper one, the small oil pressure sender, you got to keep that one in play. You got to keep that rolling. Um, you got to make sure that it it's plugged in so that the computer doesn't freak out and limit your RPM. There's been a few of our customers that ran into that problem. We worked with them. They actually informed us of what was going on. We looked into it, and luckily enough, we came up with a solution uh, there. So you should be able to adapt generation one, generation two, generation three, all very similarly if you have to do it. Uh, we'll take a look at a few other oil filter housings. That last one I had on the screen, this was your Gen 3, uh, this was the diagram. This is what a Generation 3 Mustang oil filter adapter looks like. Now, it's tough to see here because there's a lot going on, but those two round drum cylinder things that are up there, those are the protective sleeves for the connectors, and those are going to the oil control solenoid and the sender. You can see the oil cooler in play, the FL500 filter. And here's an F-150 version. Now, obviously you can see right off the bat, position of the oil filter is different. Traditionally, you're gonna have your F-150, one that kind of lays horizontally, reaching towards the front, towards the radiator. And then the Mustang ones typically just come straight out, you know, 12 o'clock if you're looking at the block uh, from the side as if you're gonna service it for an oil filter. Here again, you see both the oil control solenoid at the top of the housing now, and then you see the oil pressure sender at the lower part. Again, this is a Generation 3 F-150, and uh, obviously they cut the oil filter off of this one to inspect it, and this was a, uh, a busted up engine that we, we got as a core, basically. is kind of going over uh, what your remote options are and let's take a quick peek this one's kind of unique not a whole lot of people have seen these but this side by side here this is a, a 5.2 liter voodoo engine and the voodoo engines uh, the voodoo engines have two different oil filter housings um, the two different oil filter housings Actually, the oil, let me correct myself. The oil filter housings are the same. The filters are different. They had, at first, I believe, the canister style filter, which you see on the left. And then you have the regular spin on filter that they either replaced uh, because they were having issues with the canister or they just made an update here. But those are the two different ones. Now, the Voodoo engines are basically going to be your, um, your 5.2 liter engines. And they don't have that oil control solenoid, so you don't have to worry about deleting it. The Voodoo engines that are found in the GT350s also had remote oil coolers. Um, and the remote oil coolers are obviously going to attach to the front of this oil filter housing. As you can see, it, it kind of goes forward once you get past the oil filter there. So if you're looking at the photo, it's going to be on your left-hand side there, sticking out the front. And that's going to have its own lines and everything. So if you're using a Voodoo engine in your Coyote Swap, this may or may not be able to be used. It might be better to go ahead and switch to a remote oil filter adapter. And Ford Racing has addressed this. They've come out with a couple of oil filter adapters that you can see here on the screen. Uh, the one on the left is going to be your Generation 1 version, and it has provisions for the oil pressure sender or an aftermarket one if you want. And then you have on the right is going to be your Generation 2 and Generation 3 version. Now these are designed to bolt right up to the engine uh, and go straight to your um, straight to your remote oil filter or oil cooler. So there's no provision to have the filter on the engine with these two. And Canton has come out with something that's very similar, but what Canton did was kind of unique. They came in a little later in the game and they didn't have multiple uh, part numbers. So what you see from Canton is one that kind of does all of them. Uh, here, let me get the right one up on the screen. Boom, there we go. Now this guy that you see from Canton, this one here in particular, 
Um, it'll work on generation one, two, and three Mustang and F-150. You do have to set it up a particular way to make sure that you're oiling properly and you're not leaking because I believe on um, on one of the versions you have they give you a plug and you have to plug it off so the you can kind of see it there blatantly right in the middle of the uh, the, uh, the filter housing there and they give you instructions on how to do that we've had customers use this um, I had one customer use it and unfortunately he had some issues with it um, but after further inspection we believe it might have been self-induced uh, because he didn't have the o-rings in the right place and uh, he ended up using silicone and it, it leaked well that's not the way it's supposed to set up so it, it could have just been a little bit of misinformation or not understanding uh, that led to that but this is actually a good piece you know the Canton pieces we sell them uh, they work you shouldn't have any issues using them if you want to go that route and again it covers generation one two and three Pricing is going to be a little bit different between all of them. Uh, Canton's usually on the higher end of the scale, and there's going to be a myriad of different options out there. I'm sure Mishimoto and a bunch of other companies are going to throw their hat into the ring. That decision we leave to you, what you feel comfortable working with. Um, the Canton, the Ford Racing stuff, it's a known good product. It's a really good option. And if you find something else and it works, just let us know and share the information with the rest of the, uh, the community. Um, Let's take a look at some other options here. So why would we, what are we going to use with a factory oil filter housing to give me a remote oil filter option? Well, what you see available to you from Canton again, and there's other companies similar, on your right hand side of the screen is an oil filter adapter that goes in place of your oil filter. So you would be using your factory oil filter housing and then this guy is going to go on in place of your oil filter. Then it's going to give you your half inch MPT bungs that you can route out to a cooler and subsequently a remote oil filter location which is what you see on the left hand side of the screen. A guy like that is going to be able to mount to just about any panel, any frame rail. Again half inch MPT ports you could put oil uh, you can put oil temperature senders in there, you can plug them off as needed, and then you can also spin on a typical FL500, FL820, because this, this one in particular is a 22 millimeter stud. Uh, you could opt to get an older style oil filter stud and use small block Chevy filters and FL1As from your old Windsors and so forth, but really that's kind of determined kind of on what you're doing with the vehicle. Um, there's a lot of gray area when it comes to these products as far as quality as far as what's to use for line should I use push lock or AN should I use steel braided um, uh, the cloth braided regular hose what kind of you know we're only seeing about 150 PSI at the really really high point on oil pressure like maxed out on a coyote. I mean, I, I haven't personally seen one, but it says you can go up to this. So let's say 100 to 125 PSI cold. You don't need a massive, super high end line to sustain that. I use push lock lines on all of my oil cooler stuff. It's a little harder to work with, but I kind of prefer the clamping of it and instead of using the braided AN lines and so forth. Steel braided lines sometimes can cause issues with cutting through other components. So if you got a crammed uh, oil or uh, engine bay, having steel braided lines might be an issue for you so there's a lot of choices to make there um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of different companies that have different products that you can use and you know again you can definitely try to um, let me just angle this to me a little bit better here um, there's a lot of different interpretation as far as what you should use and what you want to use just make you using quality parts um, and you're not running any issues there uh, let's see if we can find you a complete I don't think I have a picture of it actually but uh, as far as oil coolers themselves you don't have to go crazy um, stack and plate style is kinda my personal preference when it comes to oil coolers factory oil coolers like we pointed out earlier they're all gonna be um, a liquid to liquid water to, to oil oil to water kinda designation these are gonna be more of an air to oil so these guys here, what you see on the screen are from like Setrab and Mocal. They're considered to be really high-end oil coolers. 
they make them in a bunch of different applications or, or sizes. They're universal. They got brackets for them. They get them come in a bunch of different sizes. So if you have a, a really crammed front area, you got to hide this oil cooler somewhere and try to get it in the airstream and so forth. You have the options you need there to get it done, but you don't have to go to a super high-end brand to get proper cooling. In fact, in a lot of applications, you may not need an oil cooler. Um, depending on your oil temperature so if this is just a cruiser and it's never going to see any you know high rpm abuse and your oil temperatures are going to stay you know close to your water temperatures which is in the 200 to 220 to let's say 240 range um, you may or may not need an oil cooler that is an option i don't really recommend going without one i'd like to see everybody with an oil cooler and it, it should definitely help the performance of the engine the you got to remember that the all the oil obviously being important to the entire engine it's also what's controlling your VCTs and if you have some funky running cars and you're having issues of drivability and your tuners telling you hey man I got one VCT going this way or that way oiling could be a potential issue related to what's going on and uh, we learned that early on when we we're switching the cams out in a boss 302 back in like 2013 and uh, we started the car up and it was dead on one bank um, and we had trouble trying to get it figured out and we thought we had an issue we studied the entire oiling issue I think it ended up being a tuning problem as it related to the VCT but naturally you can imagine you know the little tiny pinholes that all this oil is passing through and the pressure it's passing through getting into those VCT heads and how quick they have to react if you have oil that's thinning out <clears throat> foaming um, because of abuse, you know, you can see where it can lead to some issues down the road. So an oil cooler is definitely recommended. It's not something you have to have to have. The engine will run without one. The question is for your usage, is it going to run the way you want it, the way you expect it to run? So that's something to consider as well. Um, as we are, um, as you're planning out your build and so forth. Let's see here. Let's see if we got some questions in here. Maybe address some of the stuff that's going on uh, before we get finished up. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight, working through some of these issues and teething issues with our new microphone. Um, we're working on getting our camera set up as well, but we've got to order some parts in and so forth. Uh, let's see here. 2000 MCR. You guys are always on with us, man. Thanks for the support. Wild Horse Garage. Thank you for coming in and uh, joining us tonight. Escort Sportage. Um, spoke with him. The other day on the phone, he's building himself a uh, Coyote Swapped open track road race car, similar to you know the usage I have done with my car. So I shared a lot of information with him um, to hopefully get him uh, squared away on some of the things he was asking about and, and set up generally on the car. If you aren't following him on Instagram, do that. Um, I believe Escort Sportage is his name on IG. And he's going to be documenting the swap from, from the beginning all the way through. Um, so you guys are, should be able to get some more information and watch what he's doing and kind of apply it to your own builds as needed. Let's see here. Dan Roberts, thanks for joining us tonight. Jason Freeberg. And uh, thanks for joining. I'm just reading some of these chats here. Um, 2000 MCR cleared up what we're talking about on the Voodoo. The spin-on filter was the first design of the Voodoo. Canister style was the second gen. Those canister style filters and even the spin-on filters, I know there's been some issues with guys um, having the filters kind of fall off and create uh, oil loss. Uh, I know, I'm not sure what happened to, uh, I think it's that guy Adam LZ, uh, who's a, a internet uh, a vlogger. He had one and a young lady was driving it and the thing just caught on fire. I've seen multiple videos like that, and I think it's related to the oil filter itself. Why is this such an issue on a Voodoo? They're flat plane crank, and they vibrate like a son of a bitch. So if anything's loose, it's going to show its ugly head with a Voodoo engine. Um, I know for a while there, uh, you guys have probably know him, uh, Billy Johnson. Uh, he was one of the Roush drivers. He actually ended up being one of the Ford GT race drivers. Um, he was telling us a while back that during the development of the GT350R and the GT4 car that 
Uh, they were having issues. They were cracking exhaust manifolds. I mean, all sorts of weird stuff because of the vibration of that engine. So naturally, I think you know that's going to transfer to an oil filter. If it's going to be loose, it's not torqued properly, uh, it could fall off. That's, that's never pretty. Uh, I know myself, I've had an oil fire in my car, and um, it was because of a push lock hose. It was the first ones I ever worked with, and unfortunately, I did not know that you had to put a safety clamp on them at the end, which is what you're supposed to do. Um, so I heated them up, I slid them onto the fittings, I hooked it up, and I rolled out. I went to Sebring that weekend. The car was running great. Um, and we were having a good time. I came out of the hairpin. I was singing, going from the top of third into fourth gear on the straightaway. And I saw a puff of smoke come out from under the floorboard, which caught my attention naturally. I looked in the rearview mirror, and I saw a licks of flames coming out from behind me along with the smoke. I looked in the driver's side mirror. I saw flames coming out along the door, and uh, that was it. Now, after we got the fire put out, um, and I calmed down. I looked at the uh, under the hood, and there was there was a hose just sticking up, and that was my oil feed line to my remote oil filter housing, and it just popped loose because I didn't have that safety clamp on there, and it caused an issue. Obviously, wiped out the engine, and lost the uh, and, and made a huge mess. I had to degrease the entire car and oil down the whole track. I almost caught the grass on fire. It wasn't pretty. Um, Let's see here. We got a question from Kimbo. Kimbo says, Frank, I talked with one of your guys yesterday. I uh, gave him my email, phone, and name. I'll be waiting for it. I have the truck ready. Okay, cool. Um, thank you, for Kimbo, for reaching out to us, man. Um, hopefully, they'll be able to get you straightened out and get you uh, your quote, anything you need. Um, obviously, if you don't get a response, email me directly, info at pbhperformance.com. I'll be there to help you out or make sure that these guys get back to you and so forth. They they get bombarded on the phones and via email every day. Big quotes, um, small quotes, tech calls. We get a lot of tech calls. Uh, I think we're about as tech open to helping people with tech that I've ever really seen in the performance aftermarket. I think it's uh, just in our nature to do it. <laughs> we're all nice guys and we're all enthusiasts, so we want to make sure everybody's taken care of. And hopefully that turns you guys into customers as well. If there's something that we have that can help you out, uh, I think guys are mentioned about Adam LZ. He had the uh, the spin-on filter, and it backed off. I think those spin-on filters have like a little hex head on the end of them where you can torque them down, similar to what Fram and K&N did years ago. Um, let's see here. Wild Horse Garage says he's seen the fire vid looked like 100% over tightened to me. The blue 99, yeah, that GT350 oil filter has issues. But with the oil filter, if it's not torqued to spec, it will back out, could harm the motor. Yeah, there, I think early on when the GT350s first came out, there was a track video that came out, and this guy was in a yellow one, and it was going down the straightaway, and the video was from behind him, and it let everything out. And uh, I know there's been quite a few engine replacements on GT350s because of that. So uh, it'd be interesting to see what the final verdict is there, but... Um, a, we're dealing with a spin-on filter, which could vibrate loose. And then if you look at that remote, or excuse me, the canister style, it's just, I think it's just plastic. So if you try to torque that bad boy down, it could crack it too. I don't know. I know Ford, you know, there's always a solution out there somewhere for that kind of stuff. But we haven't run into it ourselves. On my own car, I run probably the craziest, most expensive, overthought piece on my car is my oil filter housing. Years ago, I went to PRI, excuse me. I went to PRI and I met a guy named Mike, I think Mike Coffee, and he ran clear view filtration. And these things were on display and I fell in love with them. And what they are is an oil filter housing remote that allows you to run a spin-on filter, a GM style filter. And then it's got um it's got a clear window at the top and that window allows you to see into the housing where there's a pre-filter that's basically got the same micron as some of the higher end oil filters and what you do is when the engine shut off it's got a little charge port on the side of it and you give it a little quick blast of air from an air compressor or, or a tire inflator or something like that 
And once you do that, it pushes the oil through the filter and you can visually inspect inside the pre-filter without opening anything. Now, if you see something in there that you don't like, you can actually take the four nuts off the top of the housing and open it up and take it out and look at it and clear it out and put it back together. Um, I thought I was probably the only guy in the world that bought one of those. They're about $400. Um, I adapted to my car. I blew up a 302 at Daytona <laughs> with that thing on there. And uh, uh, <laughs> it let go. It basically melted two pistons uh, or shattered them or whatever ended up happening there. And uh, it uh, <laughs> it caught most of the, the metal and silicone and gasket material in the pre-filter when I opened up the oil filter didn't really see a whole lot of stuff in there so it works um, it's a little scary though because sometimes there's stuff in that filter that you don't know if it's supposed to be there or not it's amazing how much rag material uh, from cleaning an engine before you build it is still floating around in your oil and it gets caught in there silicone um, stuff that we really don't see in a coyote but maybe on a Windsor or something like that so it's a neat product if you check it out clearviewfiltration.com uh, I have one on my car I've always used it it's overkill it's not the easiest thing it's big uh, so packaging is a little bit of an issue but if studying your oil is something you're into it's a really cool piece uh, and it doesn't look bad it looks really cool in my opinion it looks techy uh, the most famous guy I know that has one is uh, what's his name from uh uh, street Outlaws, uh, Big Chief. He was uh, he was running a, a Pontiac motor in that Crow, and it kept eating up engines. So he put one on. He was checking it after every run, and that's basically what they're uh, invented to do. So, yeah, Fire uh, 2000 MCR. That is not a fun thing. Um, it, if you ever are in a fire in a car, the key to it is to get out of the car. Don't try to save the car necessarily. It's an easy way. To die if you're in road racing they tell you if you see fire you have typically depending on how much the fire and where it is you got about 10 or 15 seconds to make decisions and get the hell out of there if you try to stay in the car while it's ablaze and try to get it somewhere where there's maybe fire crew to save the car while you're in the car you could be inhaling the heat and the flames and you can sear your lungs and you can die and I know that because there's somebody that um, in the, one of the race groups that we were in that this happened to. The guy was driving a car at Daytona. He had oil lines inside the car, which isn't always recommended, um, but it was a preference. And one ruptured. It started a fire in the car. He drove it for about 20, 25 seconds. He got out of the car, and unfortunately we lost him two days later because he couldn't breathe because he'd seared his lungs basically shut. So oil, fire, uh, never good get out of the car do it safely have a fire bottle have a fire system um, fire systems usually aren't in street cars uh, if you have a race car I know it's not a budget friendly thing to do but uh, you can at least have a fire extinguisher in there and let people know where it's at in case they need to help you well anyway um, let's go back through the chat here and see what we got going on Kimbo you can finally hear me if it sounds better great man thank you again for the uh, the paid question uh, original Voodoo oil cooler hoses leaked oil. Ford has recalled on those. Original oil cooler hoses. 2000 MTR clearing that up for us. Um, you know, not a surprise. I mean, leaking stuff on that Voodoo engine, uh, I think I would have to think that it's, an, it's a little bit harder to get squared away because they're flat plane and they vibrate. Um, so I'm not surprised to see oil leaks and stuff that's O-ring potentially having an issue there. Let's see here. Wild Horse Garage only cause the oil filter gasket. Look. Oh, you're talking. You guys are talking back and forth about that oil filter thing on Adam LZ. I got you. Uh, Joe Lubner, what mufflers for Coyote Swap? That is a completely up to you, Joe. Um, I'll tell you my experience with mufflers when it comes to Coyote Swaps. Uh, chassis has a lot to do with it because muffler placement is important. Uh, all the cars that come with Coyote engines, the ones that we listen to maybe as a base, your 11 and up Mustangs as an example, um, the mufflers are after the rear axle. So they're acting more like a resonator 
than really a muffler would be naturally. Mufflers, as I'm used to, are in front of the rear axle, and then you have over the axle pipes and, and tailpipes, and placement of the muffler does affect sound. Engines and their firing orders affect sound. As this, what we call an engine air pump, is working, we need to make sure, you know, it's going to change naturally. That's why engines have different notes. Um, the Coyotes, to me, don't have as much of a tinny sound as the earlier two valve, four valve stuff did. The the ones that sound the best seem to be the three valve cars. They have like a really throaty exhaust note uh, for having those rear mufflers, but we're not talking about those. We're talking about Coyotes. I have a chambered muffler on my car, and it's designed to specifically keep the car quiet under 100 decibel, and it works, and it sounds good. It sounds clean, doesn't pop, snap, you know, do any of that stuff. If I went with a straight-through muffler, um, I might get some of those reactions where I'm getting a lot of flow. It's a straight-through, not a whole lot of chamber, and they get a little raspier and loud. So it really is up to what you want on the uh, on the car what you want it to sound like and there's mufflers out there that can supply that if you want a more toned down sound uh, something that doesn't have a whole lot of drone I would stay away from anything that's called extreme or attack or you're gonna die <laughs> uh, as a marketing ploy because most likely they're geared up to sound loud and aggressive uh, Dynamax Magnaflow, their regular street uh, mufflers are more toned down and they can give you more of a even sound. Um, none of that stuff is really going to kill flow for performance or really add performance one over the other. Um, I think it really comes down to personal preference. So the question is going to be what do you want it to sound like? You know, and then try to find mufflers that have the tendencies of sounding it like that in particular what you're looking for and then just apply them to your coyote car so that's my opinion you know that there may be different stuff out there blue 99 frank have you seen any benefits to running a gt350 trans on a 5.0 any any generation or is it not worth it so the transmission in the gt350 i believe it's called a 3160 from tremec um the 30 those transmissions in particular i haven't heard anything negative about them in naturally aspirated applications in the gt350s themselves um where i have had issues with them is when we add a ton of boost um if you put a whipple if you put turbo something along those lines in a gt350 with that transmission she doesn't like to shift especially at high rpm and we tried three of the top clutches uh, thinking it was a clutch related issue it might have ended up being one uh, like an engagement disengagement issue um, and I think I think if it's boosted I think it would stay away from it if it's going to be naturally aspirated I don't see a problem I'm trying to adapt that transmission in there it is a nice transmission I know my friend uh, Tony Sarvis from uh, Astro Performance he has worked with them and he can get them uh, so if you're looking for a core uh, you can also reach out to Ben Calamer uh, Calamer Transmissions he can probably get you set up with one if you're looking for one um, or find one that you want somebody to go through it both those guys can help you with that as well but I don't really think it'd be an issue if it's NA if it's going to be boosted based on the experience we've had with them I'd probably stay away from it um, Tremec has a few new things coming out from what we've been told I think you're going to see a new five-speed transmission from Tremec. I think DCT might be something they do in the, in the near future as far as a standalone to control it. Um, as far as six speeds, they don't really have anything new coming out. I think they're going to be working with the T56 and then the 6060 transmission. Uh, the 6060, that transmission probably for a boosted version of that 5.0 that you're talking about there, I think would be a nice option uh, to explore if you can find the one that has the built-in uh, oil pump so you can run a transmission cooler and yeah, not a bad little uh, little extra but um, you don't have to run transmission coolers but if you have it 
why not route it, put a little MoCal cooler on it, whatnot, and make sure the fluids are uh, are nice and cool in case you have an extreme application. So I would look at a 6060 uh, overall. If you have a 3160, I think it's called, uh, and it's NA, I don't see an issue with running it. Uh, let's see here. Ford Moore Performance Gen 2 GT350 intake long tubes FFU. Uh, if I add a BAP, okay, here I'll, let me read his question again now. I know it's an actual question. Let's see. Gen 2 GT350 intake long tubes FFE with stock fuel system other than ID1050X. I'm running E85 now. If I add a BAP and a Paxton 2200 SL, Will I make more rural horsepower, 93 octane, or E85 before running out of pump? I'm going to read that question again because I got a little lost there. I got G Gen 2, so I'm assuming you got an S. Okay, got Gen 2, GT350 intake, long tubes, FFE. You're going to have to clear up for me what an FFE is. Uh, with stock fuel system other than ID1050X. So you got the upgraded injectors. You got a stock fuel system. Do you have a Gen 2, a 15 to 17 car? Uh, would be my question. And if you have a, a, a 15 to 17 GT um, E85 on a stock pump, not with boost. You're going to have to do a return style system and add more pumps. The stock pump's not going to be able to cut it. It's not going to do it safely. Um, could you do it? Yes. I think it's going to run out of steam and run out of pump at the high RPM. And they may mask that by closing your throttle body a little bit in the tuning and so forth, but it's not safe. Uh, free flowing exhaust. Okay, I got you. FFE. Haven't called it that. FFE. Free flowing exhaust. Um, all that stuff will help, but um, being that it's a stock GT, I don't think you're going to want to run a stock pump with a booster pump with boost for 85. It's not going to be an option for you. Um, I would stay away from it. In particular, I would do a return style system if you're serious about being on E85 and make sure the car's safe. At the end of the day, that extra maybe $2,000 you're going to spend on the fuel system not only is going to keep your stock engine happy and remove that from the equation as far as failures, but additionally, uh, if you do build the motor, the fuel system's ready to go to turn off the wick. So I would put that money in ahead of time, make sure it's safe, make sure it's right, and um, and then make sure that that's basically off the table as far as a potential issue for you Kimbo Frank do you know any good clutch for my 05 GT Coyote Swap stock 3650 for daily use maybe one or two passes at the track well since it, if it's going to be NA uh, Kimbo I don't think you need to go into a dual disc clutch um, that's only for boosted applications um, I would stick with and, and you're going to have a hydraulic slave so effort is a little bit easier to deal with so you can get more aggressive with a single disc clutch um, I would naturally try to get a clutch that's rated to 500 maybe 600 horsepower um, because any coyote can easily make 400 plus and if you do any mods to it you know it, it's gonna be up there in power so give yourself some headroom there the only takeaway there is you want to try to find a clutch that's not gonna chatter because it's so aggressive you don't want to have to push against a wall uh, with your left foot because it's such a strong pressure plate so um, in those cases I would look at what Ram has potentially Center Force, McLeod um, and even Mantic and see what the options are there in a single disc for that, that, that combination any one of those companies should be able to get you a nice clutch that works make sure you, your flywheel is resurfaced or replaced uh, don't make the mistake that unfortunately the guys that last did my transmission um, did and say oh you know flywheel looks good put it back in there well my car chatters like crazy and it, it drives me nuts because I know it wasn't done right so uh, John Lucero will the 6R80 Stifler's cross member work with the 10R80s too yes it will uh, the 6R80s and the 10R80s measurement wise from the face of the bell housing to the uh, transmission mount are the same length so the only, only place they differ is the 10R80 is a girthier transmission. It's a little bit tall in certain areas, a little bit fatter in certain areas. Overall length really isn't much different. Uh, I think it is longer, but as far as it's related to the cross member, it's not. Uh, you can use the same Stifler's cross members. Any cross member that works for a 6R80 essentially will work on a 10R80. 
So I guess FFE is a big Alex thing. <laughs> He's got a lot of things. <laughs> He's got a lot of things. He he explained to us one day how he doesn't think the movie Dodgeball is funny at all. So if you are a fan of Alex's and you're on his next uh, Tuesday night show, ask him if he thinks the movie Dodgeball is funny. And he will explain to you why it's not. There's no jokes. I don't think that's a popular opinion, but it's his opinion. He's entitled to it. We're all movie critics, I guess. I think the movie's fun. I think there's a lot of funny shit in that movie. So, <laughs> um, but not to get too far off topic, but um, I think that answered your question there, Ford Moore. Let me see if I missed anything. 10 or let's see here. John Lucero, 10 or 80 versus 6 or 80, which is better and why? Well, right now, I would say more guaranteed, no gray area. I think overall driving experience, 6 or 80 wins out a little bit. There's a lot of development that's already figure it out for the 6R80 transmission so that helps um, 10R80s have been a little finicky they can handle just about as much power as the 6R80 um, I think they fall short as far as big big power but they seem to be handling okay just with small upgrades clutches and, and frictions and steels and stuff like that um, that covers 99% of the uses out there we haven't really seen major failures in the 10R80s like we did originally in the 6R80s where we got to a certain power level and the forward planetary destroyed itself and then we had main shafts and intermediate shafts and all this stuff. The 10R80s really aren't like that but day to day driving uh, a couple of guys here have them they're a little clunkier than the 6R80s um, here's the other thing you're asking about 6R80 versus 10R80 you can't put a 10R80 behind a Gen 1 or a Gen 2 engine. You can't put a 6R80 behind a Gen 3 engine. I will put a little asterisk there. Standalone controllers do exist for the 6R80. They don't exist for the 10R80 yet. Um, so you could put a 6R80 behind a Gen 3, but you'd be running it off its own standalone controller, and unfortunately, you're going to get mixed results there as far as drivability and so forth. 10R80 is only going to be a Gen 3 thing. I didn't do my public service announcements at the beginning of the show. Maybe it's time to do them now. We get probably about three or five calls or emails a day of guys buying Gen 3 10 or 80 powertrains and um, from an F-150. And they're looking for a control back. And we're working on it. We've said a couple of times that we're working on it. But people continue to buy them. They must be very, very cheap. And that's fine. But guys, if you're in a hurry, if you need to get this project done by a certain time, if you're trying to get to a certain show, a uh, birthday, it's a gift, whatever, it's not a good idea because the parts just are not available yet and they're not vetted yet. Even if we do find out tomorrow that we have a combination that works on a certain build, we have to then vet it on multiple other v builds to make sure it's going to work for everybody and what the combinations are. When I spoke to Ford Racing last year, I think it was in May, um, at the Good Guys event, the issue was they could not find a computer that tune-wise was middle of the road enough to work with all the transmissions that are in a Mustang calibration wise after a lot of work I mean they were getting ready to release the Gen 3 10 or 80 Mustang control pack with a voucher and you were going to have to report to them what your transmission valve body code was they were then going to basically program the PCM for you and then ship it to you separately so tomorrow we figure out we can get the control pack to work on an F-150 Gen 3 10 or 80 powertrain. The question then is, how's the transmission going to handle that? How's it going to work with that control pack PCM? Because it's based off Mustang, and I got an F-150 calibration code. In a lot of cases, you can't force the F-150 Cal IDs into a Mustang PCM. 
it may be different this time around we don't know for sure yet but that might be uh, that might be an issue you, you may have to get a control pack and then go grab an F-150 PCM and plug it in to work with your combination because you have an F-150 powertrain so we don't know yet you know, and we're not going to start selling them and start pushing them until we know for sure because we don't want to sell you a bunch of problems that we don't have answers for yet so PSA uh, if you're buying a Gen 3 F-150 10 or 80 powertrain there's a lot of holes in your build still you can't just go into it buy all the parts and put it in over the weekend and have success yet we're still waiting we're still developing stuff so um let's see here modular fox body hey buddy it's ryan merrill you still hoarding those awesome hats don't make me drive down from ontario uh you better gas up buddy because that's a long ride uh i am try. i'm trying i swear to you ryan i'm trying the issue I have right now is that these hats right here, we have to get them made. And when we get them made, we got to buy them in like 12, 36, 48 of them. And it's expensive. And we want to make sure that everyone's getting a hat that they like. So color combinations are a problem. Um, I love this design, which is the simple PBH on the side of the hat. I think it's simple enough. The problem is that the on-demand services out there like Spreadshirt and... T Wizard, whatever, all these different things, none of them can deliver to me this design on the left panel by itself. They all want to center it. And as much as I don't mind it centered, that's how our hats were before, I don't think it looks that good. So I'm working on a few logos, a few updates, changes potentially that will allow us to work with one of those services. So if you decide tomorrow, that you want a hat from PBH and you want it to be blue with silver embroidery, you can place the order and you're ready to go. I don't have to buy 30 of them to, to, to get that combination delivered to you. If you want a flex fit instead of a mesh back, if you want a mesh back flex fit, if you want it to be structured or not structured, all those options are going to be available to you through one of those services if we sign up with one and get the designs figured out. And then, of course, we can apply those designs to multiple different t-shirts and stuff like that. And it gives us a lot more flexibility to get more merchandise out there uh, and do some cool stuff like some Coyote Swap specific stuff um, and, and, and get them out to folks that are they're wanting to, to, to kind of represent us and, and show people that this is what they're into because that's really what's going on. So I'm working on a few logos. I'll throw some of the designs out there to see what you guys think and what you might want to wear. Um, I'm trying to make it as simple as possible because I don't want to get this thing too jazzy or look too gaudy and so forth. Um, but yes, I will get you some hats eventually. Even if I have to make some, I'll get you one. You've been asking forever. <laughs> and I want to make sure everybody's happy, but uh, it's been a tough one uh, on that on that front. So, uh, For more performance, thanks for the detailed answer. I guess I will have to figure out if I want to give up E85 and be limited to 650 to 700 horsepower or blow some cash, goal is 850, 900. I would, if you're, if the goal is definitely 850, 900, you got two things that you got to consider you're going to want to do. Fuel system, because you're going to need octane. And if you don't want to buy a 55 gallon drum of race gas and keep it in the garage uh, next to the water heater, uh, E85 is at the pumps. If you have that in your area, and that's going to be your best option. If you're going to go that high of power, you're probably going to be looking at doing, I would probably consider doing a triple pump setup, uh, dash 10 feed, dash 8 return. That way you got everything covered. Uh, ID 1050Xs, they should be able to get that done for you. Uh, but obviously tuning is going to, you know, kind of data logging will tell you if they're working out great or not. The, um, as far as engine, 850 900 stock motor you can probably do it for a little while but you're probably gonna have to build that bottom end and if you want to make 900 and sustain and use 900 you're probably gonna have to sleeve that block too so keep all those things in mind when you're thinking about your goal my rule of thumb when I'm thinking about an engine for a customer is if they give me a goal let's say of 850 horsepower I gotta make sure that thing can handle a thousand if they want to make 900 it better handle 1100 if it want, they want to make a thousand, I bet this thing better handle fifteen hundred horsepower. So all the upgrades 
come into mind because I don't want to give them something that's on the ragged edge and then they find out um, that they got a problem and they just spent fifteen twenty thousand dollars on an engine and because they didn't do the extra two hundred dollar upgrade on the rods or something like that they had a, a failure so fuel systems kind of the same thing um, so keep that in mind as you're planning your build think think a few steps ahead so that you don't end up shorting yourself somewhere important or end up hurting something uh, the other thing I've seen and I'll share with you guys on this is positive displacement blowers one of the the downfalls to it or even turbos is if you have an engine failure it tends to go through the blower or the turbo so if you're pushing a stock motor and you say oh well when it blows up I'll, I'll replace that engine if you blow it up and you got a uh, a VMP, a Whipple on there, uh, a fluid turbo kit, a on three turbo kit. That stuff could potentially go through the blower, hurt the intercooler brick on the blower, and get into the rotor pack, or go all through the turbo and destroy it. So, um, I think you mentioned doing a centrifugal. There's less danger of doing that, but uh, it could do it if it blew up hard enough. Uh, don't <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> don't kill it for no reason, right? But thank you for the paid questions, and thank you for joining us tonight, uh, Ford Moore uh, Performance. Uh, we appreciate your uh, your support. Alfredo Diaz, simple yet effective. I like your current hat. Not a lot of companies offer a simple look. Yeah, I don't want to get too crazy with it, man. And honestly, with embroidery, uh, the crazier you get with it, uh, the more muddled it gets, and it gets a little gaudy. And uh, that's why I'm kind of torn. I, I want them to just be like this. I don't want to have designs all over the place and, you know, all these crazy colors and stuff. But if we're going to do it, we got to think about um, making sure it's something that is um, appeasing as many people as possible. Uh, and I don't want to start a clothing line. Uh, I'm not Drake. I don't want to start OVO or, <laughs> you know, PVH uh, version of it. We've got jackets and sneakers and socks and stuff like that. But if we do with, go with one of those on-demand um, clothing outlets uh, we do have the option to do all that stuff so if you want to get your kids something to go to a car show or your wife's coming with you to a car show and she doesn't have anything to wear you can get her something that you know would work as well so um, us making all that stuff unfortunately is a big drain on inventory and I'd rather put parts on the shelf than hats <laughs> but um, that's basically been our stance we used to have them and we ended up giving them all away and they're expensive too so we're going to try to get this figured out. Worst case scenario, what I might do is just get a batch of them done and offer them to you guys on here, and you can pay for them through the Super Chat, and we'll email them and, and, and mail them out to you or whatnot, um, uh, figure, out a way to, to, uh, figure out a way to get them out to you guys because it, it seemingly is more the folks that are engaged with us through social media, through the events that really want it, if I make a bunch of them, put them on the shelf, put them on the website, you know, we may not sell too many of them. So let's see what else is going on in the chat here. But thank you for your support, Alfred. Uh, Alfredo Diaz. Thank you. Um, Modular Fox Body says, I like it better on the side as well. Cheers, brother. Hey, thank you. Um, I like it here, man. This looks good. We have, we I had it made with a bunch of different colors a while ago. You'll see me. These are the ones I wear in the videos and the recordings and stuff that I do. And I wear them out all the time. Um, people kind of read it and try to figure out what the hell's going on <laughs> and where I work and, and what the hell that means. Not to mention our slogan's a little bit long, Coyote Engine Swap Solutions. I can't put that all in the front of a hat, so we'll figure something out here soon enough. Um... I just want to rep your your stuff. I have pretty much every swap part. <laughs> well, we'll figure it out. We'll get you, we'll get some stuff out there. Uh, Nathan Smith, Frank, can I use Fox Body sending units on a Coyote to use some factory dash gauges? I would use the end gauge for more accurate readout. I just like the old the old school gauges. Um, yes, you can. Um, oil pressure sender, water temp sender, those things can be applied as long as they're in the fluid or in the application that they're designed to they'll work the trick is like oil um, the coyote engines run higher oil pressure 
than let's say a Fox body would from the factory. And we ran into this issue even with Dakota digital gauges and aftermarket gauges. 100 PSI was a lot of oil pressure for a long, long time. And now we're operating at 100 PSI on cold startup or 100 plus. So what happens is you can put that sender in and run it through your stock gauge and it'll work, but it's most likely gonna be pegged and it's really not gonna show you anything other than the fact that it's screaming full maxed out in the red and you have oil pressure. You don't know how much oil pressure you have, but you have it. Um, so in that case, you know, you can run it, but it might look funky like it's not working. Water temp, um, it should work. I mean, it's going to be on the higher side because these engines do run a little bit warmer regularly than some of the older vehicles would like to run. So, you know, the, the sweep on the gauge, if it's accurate, uh, may show really, really high. So keep that in mind as well if you're trying to do that. Um, 2000 MCR, PBH hats or third gen control pack issue, which one gets resolved first? <laughs> Um, well, I can resolve the hats tomorrow. Uh, I just need to figure out how many people really want them and what colors and so forth and, and get them rolling. Um, so I think the hats might actually hit market before the Gen 3, but we have delivered our first test control pack to someone, and they're going to be installing it um, and giving us feedback and working with us to get it squared away. So maybe. We'll see. Maybe by the weekend. Who knows? Uh, simple is better. I agree, Mike B. Um, <laughs> Ford more performance. Okay, 800, 850, LOL. Yeah, that's a little bit closer to stock motor stuff. I mean, my my happy number on a Gen 2 motor on pretty much any stock engines is 800. I would say, you know, beyond 800. I mean, at 800, you're pushing the limits of what the factory components can do and sustain. So be mindful of that as well because uh just because we say hey it should be able to handle 800 you know and you roll out making 798 doesn't mean you're safe because you're down two horsepower from what the you know suggested limit is um and then abuse and use is another thing that needs to be considered is you know because 650 horsepower going to the track every weekend on slicks is different than 800 horsepower on the dyno and all I do is spin tires and go to car shows so not that either one is wrong but there is a difference in load and how much abuse the car is getting so keep that in mind as well uh, Kelly McMahon how about that L&M engines LM 2400 sleeve block L&M engines is excellent Michael Rauscher is a friend of ours we've used them in the past um, what's nice about Michael Rauscher is when there has been an issue because issues can happen to anybody and some more severe than others Michael's the kind of guy who says get it out get it back to me let me look at it there's no ego trip to fight through he's there to make sure your engines right by him and, and he also is gonna ask questions and make sure everything's good on your end too so that we're not spending and wasting a bunch of time or, you know, just to find out you're doing something wrong after a repair has been done or something like that. So I like dealing with Michael Rauscher. Um, liver noise has been good too. Um, don't have any experience with MMR to share. Uh, just some of the, the stuff that I've seen online. Um, there's a lot of engine builders out there that you can work with. Um, do your due diligence see what these guys are like not when everything's good get the experience of guys that have had issues with them and not the raging maniacs that are giving one star reviews telling them they're the worst person or the devil you know try to dig out people that had an issue and they went back to that builder and see what the reaction was um, because obviously you don't want too skewed of an issue but I can understand why everybody's upset after they spent fifteen thousand dollars on an engine there's a problem the guy just kind of brushes them off they're not going to give you a great you know experience or a thorough review but keep that stuff in mind you know th things can happen um even transmissions we've built um stuff can happen you know random things can happen what really is the measure of a good company is how they back it up and how they stand up at that point so i think that's more valuable than setting records because, you know, the chances that we're all building flat-out race cars and we're taking spare engines to the track and we're going to be setting records every time we go to the track, it's pretty slim. 
we're most likely we're all building street cars so we don't need a race engine for a street car and I don't want an engine builder to build me a race engine and then fall back on the fact that well it's a race engine you know what do you think is gonna happen well I expect it to hold together and I expect it to run right so make sure whoever you're working with has the same outlook and knows what you're doing with the car so uh, let's see here had some more stuff pop in here root beer showed up a little late channel support thank you as always um, hopefully the new microphone we're working through some teething issues here with it I bought the absolute cheapest microphone I could find on Amazon and uh, I think I thought it was working good but at first uh, everyone said the volume was low it might have been the way I had it set up uh, with OBS and so forth but I think we've recovered pretty well um, you missed uh, some information on oil filter housings I snafued I didn't have my boss engine photo up Oof, that blows my mind uh, let's see here let's take a look at some of the questions here there's L&M check out Hit and Skins in Orlando uh, is that a strip club or an apparel company uh, forced induction um, <laughs> do you guys sell PCM separately for 11 to 14 Mustang Coyote Swap yes we do if you go on our website uh, we should have it listed in the uh, engine management section you should be able to buy the PCM by itself I want to say they're like 900 bucks because they're brand new from Ford and then they have our flash in there. If you find the PCM that you need and you just need it flashed, we have a flash to shut off pats um, and update 11 to 12 PCMs to 13, 14 calibration is 250 bucks. We have a list in the gallery for that product, um, the tuning in particular, um, that'll tell you the calibration IDs and part numbers that you can find on the PCM itself as you would find it in the junkyard or listed online to make sure you're getting one that we know we can work with you need to find one from a Mustang not an F-150 for this to happen and there's even some Mustang ones that we've had trouble with that we took off the list so look at that list if you are going to find one used used uh, PCMs are 100 150 bucks typically uh, new ones seven eight hundred dollars so keep that in mind uh, let's see here Here's the L&M question. Here's that. Just picked up an 01 Bullet to Yodi Swap. Can't wait, Arthur. 01 Bullet. Hopefully it's Dark Highland Green, I think it was. One of my favorite cars of all time. Um, I think if you guys have done it, I think it's a great little package. I think that's a cool-looking car. I like everything about it. So do it. Give us a call. I know our speed drive might be helpful for you because you can reuse your accessories, the control packs, and so forth, even gauges. But I think you're going to want to keep those bullet gauges. So look up Steve White from VMP and his write-up on how to get those stock gauges to work because you don't want to get those bullet gauges out of there they're too pretty uh, let's see here there's a bullet Toyota me and gray gotcha everyone likes the grayed out look of the hat I have them blacked out too um, and maybe we'll get some funky ones made next time we'll see we'll throw it out there see what you guys think uh, take one just like yours, same colors. Okay, so gray seems to be the uh, the consensus so far. Um, Ford more, yep, 800, 850 until it's. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Let's see here. Ryan Wright, I have a Coyote Swap Fox Gen 2 with expansion tank. I have contour fans with a decent radiator. Coolant temps will stay around 195, but the fans are on constantly after it reaches temp is this normal um, if it's gen 2 I would ask what you're using for triggering the fans if it's the factory stuff if it's set there is a set point that is adjustable in there so in my car I got a gen 1 uh, control pack I left the fan to turn on it's a small fan it turns on at 195 degrees I think it was 198 and then when it comes back down to about 185, the fan turns off. So if you get up to 195 and the turnoff point is 185 and the coolant temp isn't dropping to that point, they're never going to turn off. The computer is going to command them to be on all the time because you haven't hit that set point. Now that set point is important because you don't want to just turn on at 195. There's no way to turn it on for 30 seconds and turn it off. It's just going to get hotter, I would think. So take a look at that stuff take a look at your tune see if there's something in there um, and then how you're triggering it you may want to 
expand a little bit on how you're triggering it if you're using the control pack or whatnot. Uh, Rude Boy Marley, I'm waiting on a third gen control pack sent in the computer. We'll keep you updated, calling for some tips. Okay, absolutely. Let us know what's going on, man. Um, John, du John W. Jr. Uh, gotta run. Thanks for all you do in these streams. Much learned from these. You're welcome, John. Hopefully you're still on to hear this, but thank you for your support, man. Um, Frank, can you Frank, can you mention a couple things that I'll need for my 05 GT Coyote swap, like the radiators, fan, or anything for the oil filter? Um, the cooling fan, you can reuse your, your 05 GT. Can you re reuse all your cooling components? Um, you're going to want to use the degas bottle. I believe there might be an opportunity there to reuse your three valve version. If not, you can use the Coyote version that comes in the control packs if you're getting a Ford Racing control pack. If you're going to be using our wiring in our control pack, um, ours doesn't come packed with radiator hoses and degas bottle and air box and all that stuff. We just can't afford to put it all in there and keep the pricing competitive. Um, so there might be some things to figure out there as far as which one you're going to use, where it's going to be positioned based on the intake tube and so forth. Um, oil, all the same things apply as far as oil. I believe you're going to be able to use the stock oil filter housings. We'll have to see which one you get as far as what engine, oil cooler, that kind of stuff um, to see and make sure that um, you're going to have clearance. If you don't have clearance, then we may have to do remote oil filter housing which isn't the end of the world. Uh, headers. Headers that are available for 11 to 14 Mustang GTs. We're working a swap for you because it's the same key member. Um, transmissions are all going to be the same options. Do not try to use the 5R55E. Dump it. Get rid of it. Uh, get it out of your life. If you have an automatic, 6R80 just makes way too much sense to do if you're going to go through the whole swap. Uh, also, fuel system. Uh, return style fuel system for sure you could try to do a return less system but you're gonna have a little bit of an uphill battle uh, we need to be able to control that pump and if you're using a stock computer you gotta have a lot of stock equipment to do that which isn't gonna be control pack friendly as far as it doesn't come set up for it so you may have some things to figure out if you try to do that to us it just makes sense to do the return stop return adaptation to the car and in that case, you can even use a stock hat from the three valve, put a bulkhead fitting in it to give you the return, or an aftermarket hat. So those are some of the things you, you typically are going to run into there. There isn't a whole lot that you need to do suspension-wise. I don't think there's anything really. Motor mounts are the same. Oil pan, be mindful if you're using the Gen 3 versus Gen 1 or Gen 2 because of the composite pans. They seem to be a little bit of a fitment issue, so... Um, if you guys have any questions that you want to squeeze in, I'm going to go ahead and sign off here in a few minutes. I'm going to try to go through the chat room real quick and answer some of these questions as we go around. I missed a few of them here. Uh, Ryan Wright, I have a Coyote Swap. Okay, we just went over you. Dave Austin, we know third jet control. Okay, all you guys, I've checked off the list here. What is the cost to get oil pump gears and sprocket installed in Gen 1 Coyote? If you're doing it outside of a car, it's about five hours worth of work. If you're doing it inside of a car, factor on about eight to ten hours of the work. We're 123 bucks an hour, so you can spend upwards of you know thousand, twelve hundred bucks easily. If we're doing a crate motor, it's usually four or five engine or four or five hours worth of work to get it in there, you retime everything, reseal everything, that kind of stuff. How about the limits on the 6R80 with stall street strip? Uh, that's going to be a long answer. I don't have it right now. Reckless Bob, is there a diagram or write-up for wiring cruise control on a Gen 1 6R80 kit? I have a 2011 Mustang base steering wheel. Sign me up for a hat as well. Uh, thank you, Reckless Bob. As far as a write-up, I don't have one. Our Gen 1 control pack and body harnesses, for a while there, we were leaving the factory wiring in them, thinking that it might have been easier to get the cruise control to work. The problem you run into, and it, it's good that you're using the steering wheel, um, those buttons... They're not just simple wiring. There's resistance involved in each touchpad. So if you're using a stock steering wheel, all you have to do is pin in the harness to the steering wheel that communication. Once you have that, I think it needs to see speed naturally. Um, and I think it'll work. 
I don't think there'd be too many hurdles at that point if you're using the stock steering wheel. The stock switch is really what's needed, and the problem is even though we can get the switches, we couldn't get the wiring. So we never came out with a kit for it. So Apparel, haha. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Doug Fid Fidelk? Fidelk? Yes. Uh, the cold air kits are here. I don't have the final version of them yet. So I haven't photographed them to put on the site yet. We're waiting on PMAS to get us some more pieces. I think the kits can actually be more universal than we expected. Um, right now, we were planning on just giving you a straight pipe, a 90 degree elbow, mass air housing and filter. I think what you're gonna end up with is a series of pipes and bends that you can use to really map this thing out somewhere custom so that um, you don't have to worry about if it's gonna fit or not. You can really design it to fit just about any engine bay, I think, once we get the, the production set up ready to go, so very soon. We have the mass airs here, we have the, the air filters, we have something right now that we can send out, but it's not our final version, that's why we haven't photographed it and, and spoken about it yet. Um, modular Fox body, should you be running GM parts on the white car, it's probably going to go slower on the track now. I will tell you, we've put the GM Type 2 pump on my car, and what we were told by a lot of folks that were asking for that pump was that it was so good the modular Ford pumps were so noisy and you can get them in all these cool different ways uh, different modifications um, right now I don't see why the GM pump is any quieter than the Ford pump in fact it's a little bit noisier in my opinion I'm gonna try to go to an autocross this Saturday night at PBIR and test it and see if it feels any better uh, any worse um, Hopefully everything works great and we don't have any issues and we're ready to rock. But right now, based on what I've seen, packaging wise, it's the smallest one we're you know, tightest setup we're gonna offer, which is really nice. But I haven't been blown away just yet. And I don't think it's because it's GM parts. It's Saginaw, I guess, is GM parts. They use the same pumps on Toyotas too, so we'll see. It might be a curse. I don't know. Uh <laughs> Let's see. Kimbo, you're welcome, man. Uh, Ryan Wright, using Ford Race control pack. Orange wire from the control pack is hooked. I never checked with Lund on the trigger points. Thanks for your help. Yeah, uh, I would email them and see where it's set at. They're probably going to tell you it's stock. Um, see if they can elaborate for you exactly where it's at. And maybe they can send you a tune with a test the same exact tune just turn it on at 195 and shut it off at 190 or maybe turn it on at 170 something where you can test and see if that stuff is communicating and working uh celine driva farm truck racing texas checking in looking forward to our next swap on my personal 96 bronco how would you get a gen 1 truck motor to 425 ish to the wheels uh well it's going to be pretty simple you can do it with intake tube, you can do it with intake modifications, you can do it with long tube headers, you can do it with octane. Camshafts will definitely help as well. I think if you do Mustang camshafts, you can pick up some easy power. If you do Boss 302 intake uh, cams, that's going to be some good power too. If you do Comp Stage 3 cams, they'll definitely help you make some power. Intake manifold, Gen 3 intake from a Mustang will be a nice upgrade for you. Intake tube, make sure it's 95 millimeter or bigger my nice straight shot and make sure the tunes on point I don't see why you should struggle to make 400 to 425 horsepower with simple simple bolt-ons uh, I know my car is a Mustang engine I'm making 430 to the rear wheels I believe with a gen 3 intake stock cams a nice 4 inch intake pipe on E85 but our dyno typically reads a little low it's a little too honest in some cases so 425 horsepower if you're not talking about rear wheel horsepower is not going to be an issue if you're talking about flywheel it's going to be really easy to do that so but thank you for the support uh farm truck racing i know you guys just ordered i believe it was a control pack for that 96 bronco so looking forward to seeing that finished up mike b frank i'm going to be hitting you guys up for a 6r build what is your preferred way of shipping 
we like using RNL carriers. They've been really good. Saya has been good to us. Um, what I would suggest is put it on a pallet, strap it down, make sure it can't move. Make sure if you're going to ship it to us, it's class 85. They typically weigh about 250 pounds. Um, that's a heavy weight. You don't want them to rescale it because if they rescale it and you tell them it's 150 pounds, they find out it's 175 pounds, they'll add $200 to your bill. Make sure they do not stack. Make sure it's marked uh, not stackable so they don't throw a bunch of crap on top of your transmission. You could go out and get a box and get some uh, foam insulation like we do with exploding foam pieces, but it gets a little pricey. I think if you put it on a good pallet, board it up with some plywood if you want to, just to make sure it's got some extra protection, go to Harbor Freight, get some ratchet straps for 10 bucks, and use all four of them and strap that transmission to the pallet get a good healthy pallet, I think you're good to go. Make sure there's no fluid in it. It'll cause a mess. Um, I'm trying to think what else I, suggestion I can give you. But yeah, class 85, about 250 pounds. And make sure that when you put in your bill of lading, put in a note that they can't charge you anything extra unless they clear it with you first. Because that's another little trick these shipping companies use to tell you, hey, it was a little hard to get to that driveway so we need another 35 bucks you know that kind of stuff so try to stay away from that stuff 2000 mcr check the gear okay you guys are talking about something else in there all right guys i have to wrap it up for tonight thank you again for your support uh thank you again for your patience we'll continue to adapt our uh setup here in the studio aka my desk um I'm hoping to get the new camera set up so we can try to use it for the next broadcast so it looks a little bit better too. Mixed with the new sound. I think it's going to be a nice add-on. Hopefully I didn't say um too many times tonight. That's uh, my pet peeve. And thank you again for your support. Uh, you guys obviously donated in the super chat. That's awesome. I will try to get hats squared away for you. If you like this great outlook, I'll get some made. I'll let you guys know and you can buy them right here on the super chat. And we'll get them shipped out to you and so forth. Uh, maybe we'll give some out. Who knows? Do some random lucky winner stuff uh, in the future. We love doing promotions and so forth. Thank you again for your support. Uh, if you're not using our products, it's okay. This is just a tech forum to, to help you get informed on what's going on and why we do what we do. <laughs> you guys have a great night. Thank you for joining me. We'll be back here Wednesday night, 7 o'clock Eastern again. Send me some messages on what you guys want to talk about. If they're not super, super involved or super tech heavy, we'll try to cover them and so forth. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you again, guys, for your support. PBHPerformance.com, 561-737-2331. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit that notification button. Hit all when you hit that notification button. Make sure you don't miss anything. And we got some other videos that I'm going to start recording tomorrow. That are going to be coming out for the channel as well, covering 6R80 stuff, 6R cooling, 6R and 10R cooling, and then in general the 6R80 transmission, what to expect, how it's built, what it can do from the factory, what we can do to upgrade it, and what to, you should expect from your 6R80 if you use it in your swap or in your high performance build. Uh, so we got some cool stuff coming out for the channel there too, and we're always taking suggestions. So if there's something you want us to cover, post it up. We'll take a look at it and see if we can put it in the show. Thank you again for your support. Always going to say that 100 times because we do really appreciate it. Thank you again. Stay safe out there, guys. And if you have anything, you need anything, info uh, at pbhperformance.com will come right to me, or you can call us at 561-737-2331. Thank you. I'm out of here. You guys have a great night. Have a great weekend. Finish your builds. Go drive your car. Have a good one.